Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, today, Mother? You? You What's the secret of the dead come back? Elias and the Drow by Jonas Ley. On Kvalholmen, down in Helgeland, there once lived a poor fisherman by name Elias and his wife Karen, who before her marriage had worked in the parsonage at Alstahau. They lived in a little hut which they had built, and Elias hired out by the day in the Lofoten fisheries. Kvalholmen was a lonely island, and there were signs at times that it was haunted. Sometimes, when her husband was away from home, the good wife heard all sorts of unearthly noises and cries, which surely boded no good. Each year there came a child. When they had been married seven years, there were six children in the home. But they were both steady and hard-working people, and by the time the last arrived, Elias had managed to put aside something, and felt that he could afford a sixen, and thereafter do his low foot and fishing as master in his own boat. One day, as he was walking with a halibut harpoon in one hand, thinking about this, he suddenly came upon a huge seal sunning itself in the lee of a rock near the shore, and apparently quite as much taken by surprise as he was. Elias, meanwhile, was not slow. From the rocky ledge on which he was standing, he plunged the long, heavy harpoon into its back, just behind the neck. But then, oh, what a struggle! Instantly the seal reared itself up, stood erect on its tail, tall as the mast of a boat, and glowered at him with a pair of bloodshot eyes, at the same time showing its teeth in a grin so fiendish and venomous that Elias almost lost his wits from fright. Then suddenly it plunged into the sea and vanished in a spray of mingled blood and water. That was the last Elias saw of it. But that very afternoon the harpoon, broken just below the iron barb, came drifting ashore near the boat landing not far from his house. Elias had soon forgotten all about it. He bought his six in that same autumn and housed it in a little boat shed he had built during the summer. One night, as he lay thinking about his new six in, it occurred to him that perhaps in order to safeguard it properly, he ought to put another shore on either side underneath it. He was so absurdly fond of the boat but he thought it only fun to get up and light his lantern and go down to look it over. As he held up his lantern to see better, he suddenly glimpsed on a tangle of nets in one corner a face that resembled exactly the features of the seal. It grimaced for a moment angrily towards him in the light. Its mouth seemed to open wider and wider, and before he was aware of anything further, he saw a bulky man-form vanish out of the door of the boathouse, not so fast, however, but that he managed to make out, with the aid of his lantern, a long iron prong projecting from its back. Elias now began to put two and two together, but even so, he was more concerned for the safety of his boat than he was for his own life. On the morning, early in January, when he set out for the fishing banks with two men in the boat beside him, he heard a voice call to him in the darkness from a skerry directly opposite the mouth of the cove. He thought that he'd laugh derisively. Better beware, Elias, when you get your femboring. Note, femboring is a famous Nordland fishing boat whose form has been perfected by centuries of experimenting. End note. It was a long time, however, before Elias saw his way clear to get a femboring not until his eldest son was seventeen years old. It was in the fall of the year that Elias embarked with his whole family and went to Rahn and trade in his sixen for a femboring. At home they left only a little lap girl, but newly confirmed, whom they had taken into their home some years before. There was one femboring in particular which he had his eye on, a little four-man boat, which the best shipwright thereabout had finished and tarred that very fall. For this boat, he traded in his own sixen, paying the difference in coin. Elias thereupon began to think of sailing home. He first stopped at the village store and laid in the supply, for Christmas for himself and his family, among other things, a little keg of brandy. It may be that pleased as they were with the day's bargaining, both he and his wife had one drop too many before they left, and Berndt, their son, was given a taste too. 
whereupon they set sail for home in a new femboring. Other ballast than himself, his wife and children, and his Christmas supplies, he had none. His son Bernd sat at the stem. His wife, with the assistance of the second son, managed the halyard. Elias himself sat at the tiller, while the two younger sons, twelve and fourteen respectively, were to alternate at the bailing. They had fifty-odd miles of sea before them, and they had no sooner reached the open than it was apparent that the femboring would be put to the test the very first time it was in use. A storm blew up before long, and soon white-crested waves began dashing themselves into spray. Then Elias saw what kind of a boat he had. It rode the waves like a seagull, without so much as taking in one single drop, and he was ready to swear that he would not even have to single reef as any ordinary femboring would have been compelled to do in such weather. As the day drew on, he noticed, not far away, another femboring, completely manned, speeding along, just as he was then with four reefs in the sail. It seemed to follow the same course, and he thought it strange that he hadn't noticed it before. It seemed to want to race with him, and when Elias realised this, he couldn't resist letting out a reef again. So they raced along at a terrific speed past headlands and islands and skerries. To Elias it seemed that he had never before sailed so gloriously, and the femboring proved to be every wit that had been claimed the best boat in Ranen. Meanwhile, the sea had risen, and already several huge waves had rolled over them, breaking against the stem up forward where Bert sat, and sweeping out to leeward near the stern. Ever since dusk had settled over the sea, the other boat had kept very close to them, and they were now so near each other that they could have thrown a bailing dipper one to the other, had they wished. And so they sailed on, side by side, all the evening, in an ever-increasing sea. That last reef, Elias began to think, ought really to be taken in again, but he was loath to give up the race, and made up his mind to wait as long as possible until the other boat saw fit to reef in, for it was quite as hard-pressed as he. And since they now had to fight both the cold and the wet, the brandy bottle was now and then brought forth and passed around. The phosphorescent light which played on the dark sea near his own boat flashed eerily in the white crests around the stranger, which appeared to be ploughing a furrow of light and throwing a fiery foam to either side. In the reflection of this light, he could even distinguish the rope ends in the other boat. He could also make out the crew on board in their oilskin caps, but insomuch as they were on the leeward side of him, they kept their backs turned and were almost hid behind the lofty gunwale as it rose with the seas. Of a sudden, a gigantic breaker whose white crest Elias had for some time seen in the darkness, crashed against the prow of the boat where Bernd sat. For a moment the whole femboring seemed to come to a stop. The timbers creaked and jarred under the strain, and then the boat, which for half a second had balanced uncertainly, righted itself and sped forward, while the wave rolled out again to leeward. All the while this was happening, Elias thought he heard fiendish cries issuing from the other boat. But when it was over, his wife, who sat in the halyard, cried out in a voice that cut him to the very soul, My God, Elias, that sea took Marta and Niels. These were their two youngest children, the former nine, the latter seven years old, who had been sitting forward close to Bernd. Hold fast to the halyard, Karen, or you may lose more, was all that Elias answered. It was necessary now to take in the fourth reef, and Elias had no sooner done so than he thought it advisable to reef in the fifth, for the sea was steadily rising. On the other hand, if he hoped to sail his boat clear of the ever-mounting waves, he dared not lessen his sail more than was absolutely necessary. It turned out, however, to be difficult going, even with the sail thus diminished. The sea raged furiously and deluged them with spray after spray. Finally, Bernd and Anton, the next oldest, who had helped his mother at the halyard, had to take hold of the yardarm something one resorts to only when a boat is hard-pressed, even with the last reef in, in this case, the fifth. The rival boat, which in the meantime had disappeared from sight, bobbed up alongside them again, with exactly the same amount of sail that he was carrying. Elias now began rather to dislike the crew over there, 
The two men who stood holding the yard arm and whose faces he could glimpse underneath their oilskin caps appeared to him in the weird reflections from the spray more like spectres than human beings. They spoke near a word. A little to leeward he spied the foaming ridge of another breaker rising before him in the dark, and he prepared himself to meet it. He turned the prow slantwise towards it, and let out as much sail as he dared to give the boat speed enough to cleave its way through. The sea struck them with the roar of a torrent. For a moment the boat again careened uncertainly. When it was all over and the vessel had righted itself once more, his wife no longer sat at the halyard, nor was Anton at the yardarm. They had both been washed to sea. This time, too, he thought he made out the same fiendish voices above the storm, but mingled with them he also heard his wife's agonising cries as she called him by name. When he realised that she had been swept overboard, he muttered to himself, in Jesus' name, and said no more. He felt vaguely that he would have preferred to follow her, but he realised at the same time that it was up to him to save the other three he had on board. Bernd and the two younger sons, the one twelve, the other fourteen, who for a while had been doing the bailing, but whom he had later placed in the stern behind him. Bernd was now left to manage the yard arm alone, and the two father and son had to help each other as best they could. The tiller Elias did not dare let go. He held on to it with a hand of iron, long since numb from the strain. After a while, the companion boat bobbed up again as before it had been momentarily lost to view. He now saw more clearly than before the bulky form that sat aft, much as he was sitting, and controlled the tiller. Projecting from his neck, whenever he turned his back, just below the oilskin cap, Elias could clearly discern some four inches or so of an iron prong, which he had seen before. At that, he was convinced in his innermost soul of two things. One was that it was none other than the drow himself who sat steering his half-boat alongside his, and who had lured him on to destruction. And the other was that he was fated, no doubt, this night, to sail the sea for the last time. For he who sees the drow at sea is a marked man. He said nothing to the others in order not to discourage them, but he commended his soul in silence to the Lord. He had found it necessary during the last hours to bear away from his course because of the storm, and when, furthermore, it took to snowing heavily, he realised that he would no doubt have to postpone any attempt to land until dawn. Meanwhile they sailed on as before. Now and again the boys aft complained of freezing, but there was nothing to do about that, wet as they were and furthermore Elias sat preoccupied with his own thoughts. He had been seized with an insatiable desire to avenge himself, what he would have liked to do had he not had the lives of his three remaining children to safeguard, was suddenly to veer about in an attempt to ram and sink the cursed boat, which still, as if to mock him, ran ever alongside him, and whose fiendish purpose he now fully comprehended. If the halibut harpoon had once taken effect, why might not now a knife or a gaff do likewise? He felt he would willingly give his life to deal one good blow to this monster who had so unmercifully robbed him of all that was dearest to him on earth, and who still seemed insatiate and demanded more. About three or four o'clock in the morning they again spied rolling towards them in the darkness the white crest of a wave, so huge that Elias for a moment surely thought they were just offshore somewhere in the neighbourhood of breakers. It wasn't long, however, before he understood that it really was only a colossal wave. Then he thought he clearly heard someone laugh and cry out in the other boat. There goes your femboring, Elias. Elias, who foresaw the catastrophe, repeated loudly, in Jesus' name, commanded his sons to hold fast and told them if the boat went down to grasp the osier band in the oarlocks, and not let go until it had come afloat again. He let the elder of the two boys go forward to Bernd, the younger he kept close to himself, caressing his cheeks furtively once or twice, and assuring himself that the child had a tight hold. The boat was literally buried beneath the towering comber, and was then pitched up on end, its stem high above the wave before it finally went under. When it came afloat again, its keel now in the air, 
Elias Bent and the 12-year-old Martin appeared too, still clinging to the osier bands, but the third of the brothers had disappeared. It was a matter of life and death now, first of all, to get the rigging cut away on one side, that they might be rid of the mast, which would otherwise rock the boat from beneath, and then to crawl up onto the hull and let the imprisoned air out, which would otherwise have kept the boat too high afloat and prevented it riding the waves safely. After considerable difficulty they succeeded in so doing, and Elias, who had been the first to clamber up, assisted the other two to safety. Thus they sat, a long winter night through, desperately clinging with cramped hands and numb knees to the hull, as one wave after another swept over them. After a few hours, Martin, whom the father had supported all this time as best he could, died of exhaustion and slipped into the sea. They had several times attempted to call for help, but realising that it was of no avail, they finally gave it up. As the two thus left alone sat on the hull of the boat, Elias told Bernd he knew that he himself was fated soon to follow mother, but he had a firm hope that Bernd would be saved in the end, if only he stuck it out like a man. And then he told him all about the Draug, how he had wounded him in the neck with a halibut harpoon, and how the Draug was now taking his revenge and would surely not give in until they were quits. It was towards nine o'clock in the morning before the day finally began to dawn. Elias then handed over to Bernd, who sat at his side, his silver watch with the brass chain, which he had broken in pulling it out from underneath his close-buttoned vests. He still sat on a while longer, but as it grew lighter, Bernd saw that his father's face was ghastly pale. The hair on his head had parted in several places, as it often does just before death, and the skin on his hands was worn off from his efforts to hang on to the keel. Bernd realised that his father was near the end. He tried, as well as the pitching of the boat permitted, to edge over to him and support him, but when Elias noticed it, he waved him back. You stay where you are, Bernd, and hold fast. I'm going to mother, in Jesus' name. And so saying, he threw himself backward down from the hull. When the sea had got its own, it quieted down for a while, as everyone knows who has straddled the hull. It became easier for Bernd to maintain his hold, and with the coming of daylight, new hope kindled in him. The storm moderated, and in the full light of the day he thought he recognised his surroundings, that he was in fact drifting directly offshore from his own home, Kvalholmen. He began crying for help again, but he really had greater faith in a tide that he knew bore landward, just beyond the projection of the island, which checked the fury of the sea. He drifted nearer and nearer shore, and finally came so close to one of the skerries that the mast, which still floated alongside the boat, grated on the rocks with the rising and falling of the surf. Stiff as his muscles and joints were from his sitting so long and holding fast to the hull, he managed with a great effort to transfer himself to the skerry, after which he hauled in the mast and finally moored the femboring. The little lap girl who was home alone for two whole hours thought she heard cries for help, and when they persisted, she mounted the hilltop to look out the sea. There she saw Bernd on the skerry and the upturned femboring beating up and down against it. She ran instantly down to the boathouse, pushed out the old rowboat and rowed it out to the skerry, hugging the shore round the island. Bernd lay ill under her care the whole winter long and did not take part in the fishing that year. People used to say that ever after he seemed now and again a little queer. To see, he would never go again. He had come to fear it. He married the lap girl and moved up to Malingen where he broke new ground and cleared himself a home. There he is still, living and doing well. So that story was Elias and the Drau. Now, I wasn't sure whether it was Drau or whether in modern Norwegian it's just Drau. Somebody will have to let me know. Anyway, I was requested to do a Scandinavian story by Leanne, who's a listener to the podcast, who's often in touch. She lives in Sweden with her Swedish husband. And I know Sweden isn't Norway, but it's Scandinavian. So hopefully she liked that one. The story itself 
was I got it from Roald Dahl's book of ghost stories. Now I've read a lot of collections of ghost stories, as you would imagine, and some aren't very good. In you know, some are just the same old stories hurled together. Some of the stories are good, but they're just overdone, and some aren't really very good at all. Roald Dahl actually says this in his introduction, but he has curated a very nice book of stories. So Roald Dahl's book of ghost stories. And if you just want to go to the show notes and click it through, I've put, and if you click, it does help me because I do have an affiliate link. Don't get very much, mostly nothing, but uh, you know, a few cents here and there is better than nothing, keeps me going. So there we are. So Dahl, of course, was of Norwegian descent himself. So this story, Elias and the Drow, was published in 1870. And I think we've got to see it against its context of the folk story revival, slightly earlier, but, um, you know, the brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen, who were writing folk tales. Uh, There was something similar with some of the Arthurian stories in Britain as well, being redone for a modern audience. So this is clearly, it is a folk story. Uh, but it's also pretty horrible. And it and thing about Elias Lai, I'll tell you a little bit about him. So he was born in Hoxund in Norway in 1833. So he's one of the oldest of the writers we've got, you know, a Victorian, although he wasn't under the control of Queen Victoria, of course. I'm sure he's pleased about that. Under the Danish throne, I think, Norway in the time. I probably got my dates wrong, but no, I think so. Anyway, he died in 1905. And uh, Jonas Lai is considered to be one of the four greats of Norwegian literature. His father was the sheriff of Tromsø. I actually learned a bit of Norwegian, and it's it's a very interesting language in that um, the syntax of it is the same as English. And I think one of the things we don't realise is the massive influence of the Scandinavian settlers on the English language. And it's, you know, English is a West Germanic language related to German and Dutch and Frisian most closely, but the syntax of it is pretty similar to Norwegian rather than German and Dutch. Anyway, never mind. I've got a linguistic background. I don't know if you knew that. Probably is why I like doing all the different accents. Anyway, so Jonas Lai. Tromsø is right up in the north and the part of the area is in the Arctic Circle. And it's very, got a lot of folk tradition. And it's um, the Sami people, the Lap people are mentioned. And of course, there's a Lap girl in the story. So lots of um, folklore and stuff going on there. And Jonas Lai was very interested, as in many, and you think even the composers that were using folk tunes in their work right across Europe at that time. Uh, so there was a big folk revival, I think that's the point I'm making. And people were interested in the uh, the soil and the land and traditions. Unfortunately, one strand of that led to Nazism, but uh, blood and soil. So he's definitely a child of that, but you can you can like this kind of stuff without being a Nazi. So, uh, which is good because I wouldn't like to think I was one. And I do like this kind of folk and, tra- and I do like folk stories and they're written in a particular style like this. So I think it's really well done. It's great. And it takes place at sea. So we haven't had one, but um, the Christmas on a Haunted Hulk kind of takes place on a boat, but it's uh, stuck in a mud flat. I'm trying to think of other other ghost stories on boats, but there will be some. So uh, Jonas Lai wanted to go in the Navy, but he couldn't because his eyes were too poor. So he became a lawyer instead, which probably was a more lucrative career choice. He published these, but he was in Christiana in, in Norway and there weren't many clients. So he spent a lot of time writing. And he wrote his first novel in 1870. So Jonas and the Lie. Um, I would say, is there a morality thing here? It's more like an ancient, um, not, you know, societal morality, but you mess with the monsters, the monsters will mess with you and vendetta and grudge. And in fact, thinking of some of the Icelandic um, literature older than this, there's lots of blood feuds and things. And so uh, it kind of is a peek back into an earlier time and the values of an earlier time. And I'm thinking even not very far from where, where I live, we had the Border Reavers, who were the who the clans who lived in the wild, lawless lands between England and Scotland that was never really part of either kingdom and had its own law and was a fairly bloody place. And blood feuds are a big deal there as well. So, and so this issue of vengeance and revenge is very old, and you find it in a lot of old literature. So, there you go. You know, and like, so quite a short story this year, this year, this uh, week, but different. And I, I liked it. So, what else has been happening? 
yes. So what I'd really love to do would be give up my job. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do this podcast and some other things. One of the things I'm doing, I've got Amazon Associates, which I've had for a bit, but I actually never have earned anything through it. So if you go onto Amazon, click through the, if you want to buy anything from Amazon, could be cereal bars, could be whatever. If you click on the links to my book, you might buy my book. Aha. There's a couple, there's the London Ghost Stories, and there's two short reads. One is which is um, The House of Bones, which is set east of Berlin and uh, the German horror story, and then the one called The Lighthouse, which is set in a lighthouse on the um, Pacific coast of California near Big Sur. So click on those, but the good thing is that you don't even have to buy them. You go off and buy something else. Maybe you want to buy a car. Maybe you want to buy a house. Maybe you want to buy something huge via Amazon. I get a tiny proportion of that. So go large. Anyway, so that's that. My books the thing and you could so if you just if you just like I don't want to buy anything from Amazon and I, I don't want to read a book I just want to listen to this podcast well that's cool um, you can um, you can show your appreciation because as we say this show is only possible through the support of appreciative listeners and I really am appreciative for all of you who do and you do support me you buy me lots of coffee on the coffee page I've actually taken a picture of my new mug We've got some kind of really psychedelic mugs with um, barn owls and Glastonbury and Stonehenge and stuff on them. So there's a picture of that on my coffee page, and this is what I drink the coffee from. And I'm really getting into my coffee at the moment, probably caused by the fact that people, and I think, oh, well, I should actually buy, buy coffee um, rather than spend it on um, sandals, you know? Anyway, so you could, and the other thing is, you could start your own podcast. What about that? You could do this. You just need a microphone. You just need to sit in front of it and edit it. And if you've got a burning interest, and some actually I know that some of you listening do have your own podcast. Anyway, my host, Captivate.fm, I really love them because they're so supportive. Anything goes wrong, they're right, right with you. And Mark, who runs it, is from Sheffield. So his voice, he's got this great South Yorkshire voice. Sheffield reminds me of Italian meals because... We used to go and visit friends in Sheffield and we'd always go out to this particular fantastic Italian restaurant. So it's strange associations. So yeah, if you want to do it, click through and I, again, get a little bit of, if you sign up to do a podcast to Captivate, I actually would, I do recommend them and I've been on a couple and I have got nothing bad to say about others like Buzzsprout and people like that have been great. But Captivate, to me, they're like boutique bespoke, you know, they're always innovating They've always got great ideas. They're massively supportive. So, yeah, that's... A, I mean, it, you, need, you know, just go to Captivate. Captivate are great. I think a lot about the future of podcasting and I think um, there's a thing going on at the moment whereby the big companies like Amazon and Spotify particularly are thinking, no, we want to we control this. So I think in years to come, they want to be... They want to have a Netflix of podcasts whereby you sign up to a subscription and you get the podcasts within that umbrella. And if you're not in that umbrella, you don't get, you don't get that particular one. Like, you know, we have, you know, Netflix and Amazon prime and all these different Apple TV, all these different things. And I think that's what will happen over the next four or five years. And it may be a way that that's a way of, of weeding out lots of podcasts, hopefully not this one and supporting the creators of podcasts. But, you know, you probably don't give this a lot of thought, but I do. Anyway, well, not a lot. I, I sometimes think about it when I'm going around on my bike. It's actually sunny today. The seagulls, in case you care. This is a very, where I live is a, is a small town. It was one of the first planned towns from, from about 1746 to export coal from Cumberland to Ireland and beef back again. So it is perched on a cliff above the sea. And the seagulls really like this because it's a seagull colony. So it means that it's very, very noisy at seagull breeding time for months. And there are like thousands of them. It is like living in a bird colony. And the, they become, they're very raucous when the kids, um, the kids, <laughs> the chicks are small. And they, now the chicks are fledging. So there's feathers all over the place all over the street of bloody sea, excuse me, seagull feathers, and they poo everywhere. And the trick is not to park just 
on a landing and a takeoff strip because they tend to do it just as they're coming in and out of their, their roosts. So we've got one that we've kind of adopted, our seagull child. And I've just been worried because I haven't noticed him today. He's fat now. And, he's, um, and his mum and dad are very good. One of them's always there and the other one's off fishing for crabs and stuff. And then they come back and regurgitate the crabs. And he seems to like that. He seems a content child. But I've noticed that he's not there at the moment. Whether he's fallen off or he's, uh, he's fledged and is flying around. I noticed some of them were in the harbour the other day, like a whole raft of new baby seagulls, obviously learning to swim as well as fly. They obviously can fly because they've got the... So you do also, just maybe in a couple of weeks before this, you have a lot of bemused and embarrassed looking seagull chicks wandering the streets because they've fallen off the roofs and they can't fly and they just wander around and hide in the cars. And, but they've got this kind of weird air as if not bothered. Mm, who do you think you are? You know, and, and then they kind of walk away. But uh, yes, so this is what lockdowns have done to me. I have become an expert on the, the toings and froings of the seagull colony. And also I think I was saying that you get jackdaws and pigeons who live with them and they all seem to get on, you know. They don't bother each other. And then there's a few trees and the blackbirds live in the trees, but the birds aren't singing as much now. But earlier on in lockdown, it was incredible the amount of birdsong. Uh, and I've really enjoyed all the wildflowers this year as well. So there we are. That, that was a ramble, but it was a nature ramble. So they're always welcome. Okay, so next week is going to be Blind Man's Buff, which is a short, very short story, but kind of spooky. So. Love, share, tell your mates, tell, you, tell your, your oppos, your buddies, your uh, maras, as we say here, friends. Or even if you don't like them very much, still tell them and get them listening. Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?